think uh, we're just past three, so do we? Are we ready to make a start? I think everyone who was in the waiting room is now in. Um, so it looks like we've got a lot of people in the in the virtual room. I, I'm chairing this particular session on the series of key words. This one on moral economy. I'm Keith Gildart, based at the University of Wolverhampton, uh, working on the coal industry. Some of you would have seen me on uh, previous sessions that we've had. I'm really looking forward to this one myself on moral economy. Uh, I've been doing a bit of work on this linked to my research on the coal industry with Andy Pershard, who's going to be one of the presenters today. So I'm really humbled in, in the company that I'm in because there's the people who are going to speak today who have much greater expertise on the concept of moral economy and its use than I do. So this is going to be really useful for me and, and my work going forward. And I'm sure other people involved in the project or people who were working in related research areas. I think I first came across the notion of moral economy when I was on a, a trade union course in, I think, 1988 in, in Barnsley in England, um, part of a, it was a study week on the past and the future of the British coal industry. And I was introduced to moral economy, obviously, through Edward Thompson's work. So that really sparked my interest in this notion of moral economy. And then I kind of lost it for a few years. And then I picked it up again in the context of deindustrialization. And Andrew and myself have been thinking about this in terms of how we understand the culture and industrial politics of the British coal industry. And I know there's a lot of other scholars who've done work using moral economy, both on the coal industry and on other um, sectors of the British and the international economy. So there's going to be lots of interesting threads, which I think will be pulled through the different presentations today. Unfortunately, each presentation is quite short. You know, I'd like to have them been a bit longer, but we've only got seven minutes for each paper. But I'm sure that in the Q&A session, we can extract a lot more information and a lot more insight from the various speakers. So I'll say something a bit more at the end. I wanna hand over to the speakers as quickly as possible. So we're gonna have the usual format. We'll have a individual presentation, about seven minutes, and then we'll move on to the next speaker. And then at the end, we'll have the Q&A. We'll also be running the comments boxes for contributions and questions. And just in terms of kind of practical, uh, technical information, it would be great if you could all mute your microphones until the Q&A session, unless you're the speaker, of course, and then make sure that you unmute. So I'm going to go through the order which I've got the biographies in front of me. So our first presenter today is Tim Strangleman. Um, I think I first met Tim about 21 or 22 years ago at the University of Manchester, and he had not long um, come from the, working in the railway industry to higher education and research, and I'd not long left the coal mines. So we had a lot in common in terms of our industrial background and also our interest in the history of work. And then we kind of lost track of each other for a while. So it's been great to connect over the last few years. Uh, Tim is now Professor of Sociology at the University of Kent. Um, a lot of you will be familiar with his work on the industrialization, on the sociology of work, on the railway industry, and most recently on this really interesting book on Guinness using oral history. So Tim's a well-known scholar internationally, and I'm really interested in what he has to say about moral economy and the insights that he can offer for this session today. So down to you, Tim, take it away. Hey, if I can share screen. Um... Can everyone see that okay? I'm seeing. Okay, so thanks, Keith. Uh, so I'm um, seven minutes past. So, uh, okay, so, so I do apologize for not using the depot, um, the logo there. So uh, um, I know people have seen this before, but I think it. Uh, this is what Reese allows me to organize my thoughts on uh, moral economy and um i have uh, been used to using ep thompson's work ever since i started my um well my um pre-degree um interest uh read um, making an english working class and i've used this diagram many times before um i think it's brilliant uh so basically my my understanding is that um, Thompson's talking about the way in which a pre-industrial society and the people in it bring to bear on industrial society or the 
the experience of it, their pre-industrial ways of being cultures, moral economy, if you like. Um, and uh, obviously, Thompson talked about the moral economy in lots of different places. This is from Customs in Common, the quote. I wanted to get the um, picture of Thompson from, um, what's that other book he wrote with his cat on his shoulder and someone said that he thought that the, the cat had written the book. Anyway, um, so Thompson says in Customs in Common about moral economy, it's possible to detect in almost every 18th century crowd action some legitimizing notion. By notion of legitimation, I mean the men and women in the crowd were informed by belief that they were defending or rights and cu or customs, and in general that they were supported in a wide consensus of, of the community. So in sense, that's, that is the moral economy, that there's a kind of shared understanding of what's right and what's wrong, I suppose, basically. And I know so lots of sociologists have actually used this quite recently, which I won't really be talking about too much. Um, a, a, a more neglected <coughs> work of Thompson's is um, his work on uh, William Blake and moral law. And in it, the book is called Witness Against the Beast. And what he's talking about is the kind of importance of religion in shaping a cultural objection to what's going on into what people are confronted with in terms of a proto-capitalistic moral order that's changing. So the objection is rooted in that existing sedimented moral order of pre-industrial patterns of behavior and cultures um, amongst common, common people, common folk. Um, and, and the beast in Witness Against the Beast that Thompson is referring to here is, is capitalism, new capitalism with its new forms of social relationships um, that are rapidly disembedding older forms and older moral economies. So uh, the beast is this kind of alien imposition. Um, and in Thompson's uh, making an English word class, it's, it's anti-English, it's un-English rather than un-British. Um, so it's a moral order then is a sense-making, a kind of structure of feeling to borrow um, Raymond Williams' ideas for. So again, I know many of you will have seen me use these ideas. What uh, I'm using, here is a mixture of Sherry Lincoln's idea on uh, half-life of deindustrialization, Carl Polanyi's ideas of embeddedness and disembedding, Raymond Williams' idea of structure of feeling, in particular, a structure of feeling being made residual to understand both the Thompsonian making of the English working class, older traditional moral economy being made residual, um, but also as you'll see in a second, the, the idea of the, the new um, uh, de industrial uh, era we're facing. And then Dave Byrne, who also used industrial feeling, again, drawing on Raymond Williams' uh, work. Sorry, this is quick, but you know, you're given seven minutes, this is what you got. Um, so, again, my wonderful slide, and, and what I thought was here, where's the moral economy in here? And of course, there's moral economy in each in each aspect of this. But in essence, what I think we're looking at is the way you talk, what Thompson's talking about is that kind of moral economy from a pre-industrial society coming up against this new order, this emerging order. And in essence, what I'm interested in is this area of disembedded through the industrial society and the ways in which workers uh, might, we might imagine workers bring an industrial sensibility a moral order to an industry industrial society so in essence what's being rendered residual here is a moral economy of industrial society confronting the industrial society whatever that is and again in just the same way that thompson would argue the moral economy doesn't just collapse in the face of industrial society it's used to shape again and is part of the emerging working class i think equally what we're seeing being made residual but still present is a moral economy of industrial society taken through into the industrial society. So again, perhaps into Sherry Lincoln's idea of the half-life. I, I can talk more um, about that in a minute if you want. So I, I, I was going to use loads of quotes and I can use them from my Guinness, but this is, a, this is I thought I'd throw a bone to the coalfield people that here. Um, this is a quote uh, from an NUM official in Durham uh, in 1998, and I think it encapsulates 
moral economy for me. So he says, you got to imagine this with the Northeast accent. Young people entering the mining industry were very, very brought in, quickly brought into the atmosphere of discipline. Because when they got underground, you have to have very good discipline. You might have three generations of people working in a mine, and the elderly generation was always very well respected. That discipline, respect for your elders, was immediately fostered onto you. So, so you got people growing up with respect for elderly people. The mining industry itself was part of the discipline that's required in society in general. I'm not talking about discipline in the sense uh, where you brutalize people, anything like that. It's a condition of mind. It's how you condition people's mind, um, minds uh, as to the way they should be conducting themselves, not, uh, not only in their work, but in society in general. So I think that encapsulates for me uh, uh, an industrial uh, and uh, Keith has given me the sign. So, um, so what I think I'm trying to, cap try to capture in Royce of Guinness, although I didn't really use the phrase so much, was this idea of a moral economy in transition, a residual structure of uh, feeling, um, an older set of values um, being used to evaluate new sets. And there's all sorts of, there's a couple of quotes that I couldn't have time to chew on in here that talk very much to that sense of um, how do we make sense of this new capitalism? Um, I won't go into that, that idea of industrial also, I haven't got time to talk about how I'm beginning. Just really finish here. So the question I want to throw out um, to, to the meeting, really, to the seminar is, what's the basis of that new moral order in this half-life? Because I teach sociology of work through all these uh, kind of uh, accounts of the new workplace, the gig economy, uh, the end of work, platform economy, uh, AI, second machine age, all these kind of uh, ideas about things. Essentially, what's being said is that this is either liquid, to use uh, Zygmunt Bauman's ideas, or fragmented or fissured, fissured work. So what's the basis for um, this area here, this moral economy, if this is such a fluid, fissured, uh, difficult area? So. Um, I'll just do some questions. There's what's the basis of a new moral economy in this new economy? Um, how can we be re-embedded in such a fragmented economy? What's the role of deindustrial scholars here? Um, what is it? Is it just to record or lament loss or to offer something else? And I'll advert for the book. Okay, Tim. Thanks for that. That was uh, that was great and a, and a really nice start to the session. And I think some of those questions that you raised at the end there, I'm sure that we'll be returning to um, once we've had the rest of the presentations. Okay, moving quickly on. Stefan Moitra is up next, researcher at probably we'll get the pronunciation wrong here, Deutsche Bergbau Museum in Bochum. I tried. Uh, from 2006 to 2008, he was Maria Curie Fellow at the Centre for. European Studies at University College London. Um, Stefan's done a PhD on working class culture and cinema in Germany and Britain after 1945, which I must read because it sounds fascinating. Uh, historian at the Bochum Museum since 2011, working on the social history of mining communities and the history of scientific knowledge. And Stefan is also coordinator of the working group Memory and Deindustrialization in the European Labour History Network. And I think you'll all agree he's already made uh, a really interesting contribution and significant contribution to this research project so far. So looking forward to hearing more of what Stefan has to say now. Thanks a lot, Keith. Um, can you hear me all right? I hope so. Um, so I want to talk about, um, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I apologize to everyone, but uh, so I'm just talking seven minutes without uh, any pictures. Um, I want to talk about an example of how moral economy plays out um, in the German context, and I particularly focus on the Ruhr and the managed decline of hard coal mining, which is what I've been working on over the last years. Although the discourses and semantics prevalent there in that case still have a relevance today whenever plant closures are discussed or, for instance, in the context of 
open cast lignite mining, which has been heavily embattled in recent years between climate protesters, uh, minus trade union, and the level of politics and government. If we look at the ways in which the shrinking of the mining industry in the Ruhr and other German hardcore regions is understood in hindsight, um, the grand narratives usually is one of socio-political success. As even though an industry that once comprised a workforce of half a million people roughly has now vanished, the actual process of closure, rationalization, diminishing the numbers of workers in production was stretched over a period of five decades, 50 years. In this space of time, a system of direct and indirect state subsidies was set into practice, which crucially also involved early retirement schemes and the re relocation of younger workers from closing collieries to neighboring or sometimes also further distance pits. In this way, mass redundancies were avoided, at least in the mining industry itself, while there remained the task for regional and federal politics to find new structures of employment for the younger generations that were to come. Now, this is obviously a very condensed summary of a very complex long-term process that involved a range of actors from the 1960s until very recently. That is workers, employers, trade unionists, politicians, um, and the list can be continued. But the question is with regard to the moral economy of handling industrial decline in this way, what bound these, these actors uh, together, some of whom might have followed very different interests and points of view. Or to use Thompson's terms, what were notions of legitimation in this process of change that reflected, again, the quote from Thompson, wide, a wider consensus of the community about the ways to react to this challenge. And there's a key term here in the German context, which became a key semantic denominator for all involved. And that's the German term Sozialverträglichkeit. As always, such terms are tricky to translate. Literally, Sozialverträglichkeit means socially compatible, uh, applicable, socially compliant. But in a more comprehensive sense, Sozialverträglichkeit is about social responsibility. And the call for all involved uh, to act responsibly in the context of crisis. So if I said earlier that the shrinking of the industry is seen as a success story today, this narrative is closely linked to Sozialverträglichkeit. Structural change has been successfully uh, successful because all parties involved acted socially responsible. So that's the, that's the narrative. Now, what does this actually mean, acting responsibly? And I want to highlight some of the implications here which this term carries. First of all, there's an implication of inevitability of economic necessity and the assumed factuality of market forces that had to be rebalanced. So in the fact, uh, the fact that German coal was too expensive and co could not compete internationally on the international market. Secondly, there is a distinction to the language of class and class struggle. So there's a distinction between the notion of responsibility, of a mutual responsibility and class struggle. Notions of class and the threat of redundancy and social rupture are implicitly part of the setup, but it's in the, it's in the mutual interest of all involved, of wider society, to avoid this and provide responsible solutions. So this is a call to all those who might act from, a different from different positions of interest to join in a common goal. Nonetheless, the language of class and of the labor movement can play a role uh, too here, but not so much in a manner of conflict. Rather, it becomes a matter of solidarity, for instance, for the mine workers, both collectively and individually, to give their consent to the measures negotiated, even though leaving for early retirement or traveling long distances to new workplaces might be a strain for many. And thirdly, in the practice of responsible crisis management for the people concerned, the miners, Sozialverträglichkeit was closely entangled with an economy of trust. Now in the world of mining, trust is a crucial topos. For the experience of working underground, you have to trust each other, trust in the system of social security and occupational health, trust in the trade union, and especially its role in finding the best solutions to tackle the crisis. 
and the threats of redundancies and also trust in the goodwill of the state once the system of mutual responsibility was set into practice. Once the fragile structure of enacting social responsibility, solidarity and trust got out of balance, things became difficult and could not be contained so easily, which was particularly the case in the late 1980s and 90s when the Christian liberal government repeatedly threatened to drastically shorten subsidies and literally tens of thousands of jobs were at risk. This was seen by the miners as a clear break with the system of mutuality and massive protests ensued that were on the verge of getting out of hand for the union at some stages in the 1990s. So to sum this up, the moral economy of mine closure in the rural sometimes seems like an echo from the old West German welfare state when the willingness to contain social conflict was strong, which was arguably, st arguably still um, a consequence um, of the context of the Cold War. But since the 1980s and 90s, the political will to keep up with, with Sozialverträglichkeit eroded. The abrupt breakup of large parts of the industrial sectors in the former GDR after German re re reunification in 1990 marks a clear difference here, for instance. So do, do the reforms of the labor market in the early 2000s, when it was a social democratic government who, while declaring solidarity is not a one-way street, shortened unemployment benefits and increased the pressure on people out of work. In this light, Sozialverträglichkeit and managed decline were a success, as over five decades, former miners did not have to put up with unemployment benefits and being hassled by the labor office. Thanks. Okay, Stefan, thanks for another really interesting presentation. And again, some links with mining from the previous paper, which I'm looking forward to picking up later. Uh, moving on to the next speaker, we've got Marion, oh, sorry, no, I'm jumping ahead. It's Lachlan this time. It's Lachlan McKinnon, uh, Canada Research Chair in Post-Industrial Communities at Cape Breton University. Uh, his recent book is Closing Cisco, Industrial Decline in Atlantic Canada's Steel City. And Lachlan uses a lot of oral history to underpin this book, looking at the environmental changes wrought by deindustrialization with a specific focus on the environment, ecology, labor, and occupational health. So again, lots of fascinating themes, which we can um, explore in more detail a bit later on, but Lachlan uh, will tell us a bit more about it now. Thanks, Keith. Um, I'll share my screen here. Uh, let me know if it works. Can you see that? Yes, all right. So E.P. Thompson's influential work on moral economy describes the concept as, quote, a consistent traditional view of norms and obligations of the proper economic functions of several parties within the community. The crowd expresses embedded notions of a moral economy during the long transition between what he calls a paternalist model of food production and distribution, and then the liberalization of this process uh, through the late 18th century. And offenses against the moral economy were met with direct action through things like the sacking of granaries and so on. But those sorts of events were only really flashpoints that reflected the existence of a broader community-based sensibility. So presenting a critical framework through which we might understand working class reactions to structural change, moral economy holds, I think, great promise for the study of deindustrialization. As Christopher Lawson notes in his recent History Compass article, uh, this idea has actually been employed extensively by um, scholars of deindustrialization, uh, some of whom are, are talking in the, the panel today. Uh, in the UK context. Now in Canada though, the idea has been kind of slower to emerge. Um, through a, a survey of the pages of our National Labour History Journal, Labour Le Travail, it reveals that moral economy has mostly been applied in the context of industrialization, so drawing extensively upon the Thomsonian example. Brian Palmer, for example, uses the term to describe the transition between craft and industrial production. Um, Sean Cadigan uses it uh, in the context of Newfoundland to explore fishing protests where fishermen began destroying newly purchased equipment or vandalizing merchant homes. And these actions emerged in violation of what he called 
the customary preservation of equitable access to the fishery or to the resource. So taking Thompson's assertion of what he called the long, public, uh, long popular memory that moral economy draws upon, to take that idea seriously, I wonder whether there are fruitful explorations to be had in connecting working class conceptions of moral economy under deindustrialization to those that emerged in the same areas or the same occupations during industrialization. So just as the 19th century food riders drew upon ingrained notions of just price dating back to the 1580s, I think Thompson describes, um, it strikes me that there might be similarly broad rights-based understandings of moral economies in, in places like the coal fields in Cape Breton or, or in Scotland that underpins working class resistance either, even in the later 20th century. So in my area of research, Cape Breton Island in Eastern Canada, Nova Scotia, um, a moral economy among the island's coal miners was becoming visible as early as the 19th century when the London-based General Mining Association emerged. And now the small coal towns of Little Glace Bay and Cow Bay that began growing at this time drew their labor mainly from the rural agrarian areas of the island and were comprised largely of either recent Scottish immigrants or the descendants of Scottish immigrants from the Western islands and the highlands. Now in Sydney Mines, the largest of the coal communities, uh, it was more heterogeneous as skilled labor and management came from, from England and, and elsewhere in Canada. Um, as David Frank and Danny Sampson have noted, the coal communities though, remained deeply enmeshed even after industrialization with rural life. So it wasn't unusual for miners to return to the countryside at harvest time, for example, and social and familial ties of the backlands were constantly being renewed, uh, even through the industrialization period. Now, these insular experiences of shared rural life, close familial and ethnic ties, and an emergent class consciousness in the coal towns combined to inform a moral economy that stressed the maintenance of those bonds over the, the new liberalization of the economy or the desires of the absentee ownership class. So while the mineral rights, you know, this is one example, were held by the crown, these communities soon established a long-standing pattern of surface coal picking uh, for personal use, and that extended into the 20th century. And the first inkling of moral economy comes when the GMA began prosecuting people for this surface coal picking, which was in violation of their longstanding understanding that that was something that you were just able to do, especially if the coal was available from the surface, the seam was visible. Um, in fact, there's one account from the 1840s when a coal company informant is actually beaten within an inch of his life for exposing a small surface coal picking operation. Um, similarly, as historian Don Nervous describes, uh, the New York Times and the London Times both described riotous scenes at, at the Lingan Mine in Cape Breton in 1883, uh, when miners were walking out in, in response to attempts to blacklist members of the, the PWA trade union. And that strike included threats and attacks on strike breakers. Uh, there's an image there from one of the threats. Um, as well as uh, in 1876, there was an attempted assassination of one of the mine managers. And these stories continued to percolate in, in these areas. There was very little uh, transition in the towns themselves. And so the stories kind of stayed around. So while the workforce at Cape Breton Collieries diversified significantly in the early 20th century, the sense of community-based support for direct action uh, in response to violations of the moral economy remained clear. Um, of course, nationalization of coal and steel in the 60s quieted those sorts of direct action responses, but they did reemerge towards the end of the 20th century as the industrialization unfolded. Um, in, oh, sorry, in 1981, uh, two bombs were set off in the Lingan mine during a three month coal strike. And despite the perpetrators being known within the community, no charges were ever laid um, as, as the result of that, no information was forthcoming. Thanks, Keith. Um, in 1996, a unionized construction firms burnt down an apartment complex that was being built here on the island um, because it was being built by a non-union off-island construction company. And in the media accounts, uh, historian Donnie McGilvery, who commented on the issue, remarked that this should not necessarily be surprising in a place with such a strong community support history for direct action. 
And although reporters would likely hear firm condemnations coming from Halifax or elsewhere in Canada, the communities in Cape Breton have a kind of different attitude towards some of these things, right? Um, and in these instances, obviously, these are moments where the moral economy, the perception is that it's being transgressed, either by unilateral decisions of the absentee off-island ownership class or by the threat of serious economic harm to the community itself. But I only have a few sentences left. Um, in understanding then how moral economies influence community responses to deindustrialization, I think we must first try to unpack how they're formed and how they grow in response to new stimuli. So in Cape Breton, I suspect that the moral economy of the coal field was deeply influenced by Thompson's kind of long cultural memory of rural pre-industrial culture and the bonds that, that were informed by that. Um, and then many of those deeply embedded cultural expectations survived into the 20th century, but were also reshaped and influenced by things like the, the recognition of trade unionism, the nationalization of the coal field, the operation of the coal field under Crown, uh, Crown Corporation and so on. So while the flashpoints of direct action might key us into moments where the moral economy is transgressed, it's important to consider which aspects of moral economy remain intact, which are cast aside, and then which kind of are reshaped as we move forward. Um, and as communities experience both the operations of the kind of modern industrial workplace and deindustrialization and industrial closure. Um, so thank you for your time. Thanks, Lachlan. Uh, again, really got my mind thinking about some of the, the questions here and how they connect with the other papers. So uh, thanks for that. Uh, moving on now, this time we do have Marion Fontaine, a lecturer in contemporary history at the University of Avignon and a researcher at the Norbert LAS Centre. Uh, she originally worked on the relationship between sport and the construction of working class identity. Fascinating subject. Her work now focuses on deindustrialization and the crisis of workers' worlds, based in particular on the case of coal miners in France and Europe. So, when you're ready, Marion. Yes. Uh, thank you, Keith. Uh, I will show my presentation. Yes, it's sad. And as Lauren said, I will uh, uh, make my presentation in French. So, in En mars 1963, les mineurs de charbon français s'engagent dans une grande grève nationale qui est leur dernière grève. Lors de cette grève, les mineurs ne demandent pas seulement des augmentations de salaire, mais ils expriment aussi un, profondément, un profond sentiment d'injustice. On est les derniers, disent-ils. La dureté du travail minier, les risques qui accompagnent ce travail, mais aussi la fierté et la dignité des mineurs, paraissent être négligés par des politiciens et des experts qui souhaitent une modernisation économique dans laquelle le charbon, le travail des mineurs et leurs valeurs morales sont déjà renvoyés au passé. Alors, cette grève tente à montrer que l'économie morale des mineurs, les valeurs et le pouvoir informel mobilisés par le groupe pour légitimer et renforcer leurs revendications, apparaît comme un enjeu décisif dans un contexte de désindustrialisation et de fermeture des puits de mine. Mais ce que je voudrais souligner ici, c'est, comme ont déjà commencé à le faire Stéphane Moltra et Tim Strangelman, la complexité de cette notion d'économie morale, si on veut la mettre en œuvre à propos de la désindustrialisation. D'une part, en effet, parce que dans un contexte de désindustrialisation, ce concept ne peut se résumer à une opposition euh, tranchée entre d'un côté la tradition, les valeurs traditionnelles de la communauté minière, et de l'autre la modernité, la valorisation du changement et de l'efficacité économique, mais qu'il faut voir comment les deux s'articulent. Deuxième élément de complexité, je pense que cette économie morale, elle ne se manifeste pas seulement dans les moments les plus intenses de rébellion ou de mobilisation, ce qu'avait par exemple très bien vu, là encore, Epi Thompson, mais il faut aussi chercher comment elle permet aux mineurs d'agir, euh, en quelque sorte, de retrouver leur part d'agency, de placer réellement 
ou parfois juridiquement, d'ailleurs légalement, des limites euh, et de manifester leur part d'activité, y compris dans un cadre de fermeture. Alors, cette question d'économie morale, de pouvoir que, que peuvent conserver les mineurs dans une situation de désindustrialisation et de fermeture des puits, elle est particulièrement importante dans le cas français, même si la notion d'économie morale a dans ce cadre-là, mais je pense que des gens comme Xavier Vignat ou d'autres qui sont dans le public pourront aussi faire des remarques, cette notion d'économie morale a été jusqu'ici peu employée dans les études françaises sur la désindustrialisation, du moins dans les travaux qui sont déjà publiés, alors même que ça semble une notion particulièrement utile pour comprendre un certain nombre de caractéristiques des processus de désindustrialisation en France, et par exemple des processus de fermeture des mines en France, et peut-être euh, ailleurs en Europe. J'ai été frappée euh, particulièrement dans ce cadre euh, par la notion que l'on voit beaucoup dans les années 60 de fermeture socialement acceptable ou d'acceptabilité sociale des fermetures, qui apparaît très souvent dans les négociations des années 60, qui tend à vouloir dire que les experts et les modernisateurs ne peuvent pas tout faire que d'une certaine manière ils le savent et qu'ils ont conscience que le rythme des fermetures, du moins dans cette période, est conditionné par la manière dont les mineurs eux-mêmes sont capables de poser certaines limites ou de mettre en avant leurs propres normes. Deux de ces normes me paraissent particulièrement importantes. La première, elle a déjà été notée par notre collègue James Phillips dans ses travaux sur les mines écossaises, c'est la demande de stabilité qui s'explique aussi par la longue expérience de précarité, évidemment, longtemps attachée à la condition ouvrière. Cette demande de stabilité, vous voyez ici l'extrait, qui est très présente dans les entretiens qu'on peut faire avec, enfin, qu'ont pu faire certains sociologues avec les mineurs dans les années 60. Cette demande de stabilité, dans un contexte de fermeture, elle implique que les fermetures ne peuvent être acceptables que si elles ne conduisent pas à des mutations à des déplacements imposés ou à des conversions imposées dans d'autres secteurs industriels. Si elles maintiennent en quelque sorte les ouvriers déjà présents dans leur cadre traditionnel, les dirigeants miniers se plaignent beaucoup de cette incapacité, voyez encore cet extrait des mineurs à bouger, disent-ils, mais il est clair que cette résistance des mineurs à une mobilité qu'on veut leur imposer est un phénomène extrêmement important. L'autre phénomène important, me semble-t-il, qui n'a peut-être pas été assez souligné, c'est le souci d'un futur, d'un avenir durable et de la préservation de la destinée des enfants. C'est une manière de dire que les mineurs, pas plus que les autres ouvriers, ne vivent seulement au présent. Et une bonne partie d'entre eux, au moins en France dans les années 60, euh, j'ai l'impression, euh, ont bien conscience que le métier de mineur est un métier dangereux, dur, et que sa pérennité n'est pas forcément durable ni souhaitable dans l'avenir. C'est par exemple ce que disent ici des mineurs dans, euh, après une catastrophe survenue dans le nord de la France en, 19, en 1965. Notre métier est un métier de bagnard, il ne faut pas compter que nous mettions nos enfants à la fosse pour ces salaires de misère. Donc ça veut dire que, euh, encore une autre citation montrant la même chose, ça veut dire que euh, cette idée d'un futur durable pour les enfants et d'un futur qui n'est pas forcément celui de la mine conditionne aussi la manière dont, pour finir, les mineurs euh, avancent leurs propres normes et l'avancent différemment pour eux et pour leurs enfants. Ça permet de comprendre pourquoi les mineurs euh, en place tiennent pour eux-mêmes à la préservation de leur travail, à la préservation de leur statut qui est en statut légal depuis 1946, et donc à la préservation de leur métier, mais en même temps euh, tiennent effectivement pour leurs enfants, non pas forcément un futur lié à la mine, mais un futur euh, qui passe par, une, euh, meilleure, euh, par la création d'emplois meilleurs et plus qualifiés. Donc ça veut dire, pour euh, terminer rapidement, que l'économie morale apparaît moins dans ce contexte comme une préservation à tout prix des valeurs traditionnelles minières que comme une demande d'une autre modernisation économique, plus juste, plus durable et adaptée aux attentes des acteurs. 
Et ça veut dire aussi que ça pose la question de euh, ce qu'ont pu, pour finir, faire triompher les mineurs. Ce qu'il semble, c'est que la demande de stabilité a en partie euh, prévalu parmi les mineurs, notamment parce que la majeure partie des fermetures des mines en France ont lieu avant la grande crise économique des années 70, mais que la préservation du futur des enfants, ce qui était pourtant le plus important, a été beaucoup plus difficile à obtenir, et c'est ce problème-là qui continue, je pense, à peser aujourd'hui sur les anciennes régions minières. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Another really interesting presentation. Uh, some of the uh, insightful material there. Again, I've been taking notes and formulating too many questions that I'll have for the sessions, but yes, yeah, really interesting presentation. Uh, moving on now to the next paper, it's Andy Perchard, Professor of Industry and Society at Newcastle Business School. Uh, for the last four years, Andy and myself have been leading a research project on the post-war British coal industry, um, looking at the industry from nationalisation to uh, its ultimate demise in the 1980s and 1990s. And, One of the things that we've been talking about a lot throughout the project really is this notion of moral economy and how we could apply moral economy or critically think about the concept of moral economy in relation to the nationalised coal industry. So I'm sure that Andy will be reflecting on some of this in his own paper. Um, apart from working on the coal industry, uh, Andrew's published various pieces on the industrialization, business government, labour relations, Uh, industrial, uh, regional and development policy, work on the aluminium industry, and he's also an editor of History Workshop Journal. So welcome, Andy, and looking forward to hearing what you've got to say on moral economy. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, everyone. Difficult to follow those uh, fantastic papers. I'm just about to uh, share my screen. Hopefully this will, this will work. Uh, hopefully you can all see that. Yeah, good. And you can hear me clearly. Okay, I'm quickly going to uh, touch on um, Thompsonian ideas um, in this. Particularly one of the things that I'm keen to look at is, is the notion of uh, dimensions of time and place and the transferability of those in, in, con in conceptualization of moral economy. Um, so a quick... Uh, reminder here of um oh sorry okay let's sorry this is uh i've just got to uh here we go sorry my screen um okay now hopefully this will work okay so thinking about what thompson was Uh, talking about in, 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 and the importance of um, his ideas in, in carrying forward in, in relation to how we think about community here and the complexities of that and, and notions of norms and practices. Um, but what I'm more interested in trying to explore today is about the, the, the idea of temporality in this. And Tim's touched on this earlier in terms of some of these Um, ideas of how this can be aligned with pre-industrial, industrial, and, de and post-industrial society. Um, now, it's interesting that I think one of the things that the misconceptions, and that this comes out to a degree in um, uh, Jim Tomlinson's 2011 piece about the moral economy, about Thompson, is that um, He's restrictive in the in the use of time. Clearly, he's and as a lot of the speakers have spoken about before, um, that there is this sense within Thompson's work actually of the um, of the uh, transference of some of these ideas over time, and I'll, I'll talk about that in relation to a number of uh, uh, of contexts. Although he's talking about a very distinct time. Uh, some of these ideas are carried through in the idea of uh, community and, uh, and norms. In fact, I think what's possibly more uh, pertinent in terms of constraints of time in, in the use of uh, uh, moral economy is perhaps in, in Pollyani's work. Certainly, um, uh, 
Ava Offner in a piece in 1997, uh, talking about reciprocity in trade, in, in, uh, in economy, into moving into uh, new markets, was quite critical of Pollyanni's discussion in this, in this area. So what I'd like to focus on next is a quick uh, jumping around here, but is the uh, notion that Tom Thompson in the, is urging care in the application of the concept. But um, and in that he's not alone in that and uh, the political economist and social theorist Andrew Sayer has said the same thing in terms of criticizing certain uncritical political economy. Um, which, as he says, mistakes these historically specific developments uh, for trans historical principles. I think what's important here, though, is, is then what he develops in his, uh, what he denotes as the evolution of moral economy reflected, as he says, to some extent, moral political values regarding economic activities and responsibilities co-evolve with economic systems. Like Thompson in, this, the, uh, in terms of showing the long durée of ideas being played out, um, he's also exploring um, in, in a more theoretical sense perhaps than, than Thompson, this balance of class and social forces. So I'd like now to come on to some other limitations that might be picked up, but I think that are, are pertinent in terms of how we think about this in relation to deindustrialization. One of those is, is the geographical boundaries. And again, um, con uh, the suggestion, such as most recently by Priya Satya, that um, Thompson was how, somehow provincial, as she said, in his focus and hemmed in by the Thompson family's own sense of great man capacity to change history is, is not necessarily reflected in the work. I think what we find in this work is um, an attempt to look beyond those, but, but the natural tendency of a historian to, as, as a, to, to reflect on his time period and place. Um, in, indeed, in the English crowd, he, he does talk about extending these ideas to other geographical spheres. Um, clearly, obviously, there's been a, 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 a heated debate over um, the place of women in Thompson's writing, um, notably with some um, extensive debates between people like Joan Scott and um, uh, Sheila Robotham and um, Anna Clark and uh, Barbara Winslow in the in the eighties and nineties and beyond. Um, again, uh, Thompson, as Sheila Robotham said, was um, you know did to some extent neglect women in his analysis, but he was a lot more reflective than many historians of the time on the role of women in agitation. Um, and more, more so, she expands to say that the, the methodology, as, as does Barbara Windsor, Winslow, um, uh, feeds into the methodologies that developed in second wave feminism around women's history for this, this period. Crucially as well, um, pointing out that Thompson uh, and was, was absolutely also aware of uh, of the limitations that he didn't went, wish to uh, stray into areas that Dorothy Thompson was already and had long been working on. So I just want to focus now quickly on some of the ways in which recent pieces have focused on, have used moral economy. And in particular, there's been a lot of discussion here about that literature in relation to the British coal industry, which has brought forward some interesting and novel ways of trying to bridge both methodological differences be between so-called lay morality and broader political economy, such as in uh, uh, Jim Phillips's work and in Ewan Gibbs, but also in terms of looking at the idea of community itself. And um, I'm thinking here about, I mean, something we're very much 
seeking to we're trying to do with the on behalf of the people project in terms of viewing community more broadly than and, and community activism more broadly but also in the work of people like um uh, Natalie Tomlinson and uh, uh, Florence Sutcliffe Braithwaite. Um, we've also, as both Jim Phillips and myself and Keith and, and I have looked at, have explored how moral economy affected the decision making of managers in the industry as well. Um, and, and in particular, exploring in relation to Eric Olin Wright's theory of um, to, to of um, uh, of uh, of of, uh, of uh, conflicted spaces, uh, trying to combine those to explore how managers have viewed uh, viewed changes in the political economy. Finally, um, I'd like to look at quickly at, at, at moral economy in terms of geographical differences, and here is the use of Thompson in in relation to the high, Scottish Highlands and Islands is, is the idea of talking about distinct understandings of lay morality here. Um, so uh, Thompson was very much used in the, the, by in a very prominent piece of work in published in 1976 about the Highland clearances by James Hunter, the making of the Crofton community to explore the community, explore community activism. And we're talking when we're talking about this transference of ideas. Um, again, it's brought out in Nev Kirk's *Custom and Conflict in the Land of the Gale*. Of course, Nev Kirk was a, a former student of Edward and Dorothy Thompson's um, to explore how specific ideas within the Highlands transferred in subsequently in labour struggles something that I then subsequently did as well in my own work on the aluminium there, uh, industry there, in particular to take up ideas like um, the, the community struggles from land agitation and how they were transferred into industrial struggles and long-standing notions of the uh, Gallic idea of duchthus, heritable trusteeship, the fact, the idea that you were caring for the land collectively that was to be passed on. So I bring these up briefly to give another dimension. Obviously, James Scott's work looked at, uh, at moral economy in relation to pre, um, during colonization and, and decolonization of moral economy in Burma and Vietnam as well. So it's it, trying to look at a, um, a broader classification of how we uh, of how we look at deindustrialization. Thank you. Sorry for the overrun. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Again, some really interesting insights there, both kind of local and and international. Uh, moving on to our final presenter today, it's Pascal Rashi, who's lecturer at the University of Lorraine. Pascal is a really interesting biographical background, being the grandson of two iron miners. Uh, son of a former accountant of Lormines, the last French company that operated the iron mines of Lorraine. Thus, his family have participated directly in the history of the industry in this region. Uh, born in the 1971, experienced dis the disintegration of an ancient industrial world that had been forged on the strong cultural and social identity of the region. So very relevant to some of the ideas of our moral economy that we've been talking about. So over to you, Pascal. Thank you, Keith. Uh, I will talk in English. Uh, en 1971, justement, l'année de ma naissance, uh, Thomson définissait ce qui est désormais un article classique sur l'économie morale qui nous, qui nous rassemble aujourd'hui ici. Uh, sa réflexion sur l'économie morale uh, concerne des foules, des foules de la fin du XVIIIe siècle. Et elle, cette réflexion a donné corps à un concept qui a été appliqué à d'autres mobilisations. On en a parlé juste avant. Et puis, une historienne comme Joan Scott a étendu au monde colonial ses réflexions. 
d'autres historiens, sociologues, se sont inspirés de ce concept pour l'étude des groupes dominés. Et, et puis, comme l'a cité Marion et aussi Andrew, juste avant moi, Jim Phillips l'a utilisé pour la période 1947-1991 pour les charbonnages écossais. Et il a essayé de montrer qu'on pouvait étudier l'économie morale par rapport aux politiques de mise en œuvre de fermeture de puits de mine et par rapport aux populations ouvrières qui subissent la désindustrialisation hein, dans ces décennies, on va dire, de la fin du XXe siècle. Alors, en France, le concept d'économie morale, moi, je vais essayer de le discuter dans le cadre de l'accompagnement social de la désindustrialisation et donc des protestations des sidérurgistes vis-à-vis -vis de, de cette, des fermetures d'usines, de leurs conséquences culturelles économique, sociale et aussi territoriale. Hein, Andrew vient de parler de l'aspect géographique. Donc ça aussi, c'est quelque chose qui est très important. Je vais me placer sur la période qui va de 1974 à 2014. Et euh, je vais essayer de voir, à partir de là, comment on a euh, eu une évolution de ces manifestations contre les fermetures les fermetures d'usine. En fait, moi, ce que je vais essayer de vous montrer ici, et comme on a, on a peu de temps, c'est qu'il existe quatre phases de gestion de cette désindustrialisation dans le secteur sidérurgique en France, avec des références ou pas euh, à l'économie morale. Et euh, j'ai essayé de trouver quatre différentes phases pour cette, euh, ces liens entre désindustrialisation et économie morale. Alors, j'ai déjà une petite, une petite présentation pour vous montrer que le, la désindustrialisation en France, c'est un phénomène global et que pour la sidérurgie, hein, c'est ce que vous voyez à droite, on a effectivement un, une chute vertigineuse des, des, des effectifs euh, voilà pour, le, pour la carte de la France. Donc, euh, moi, je, la première période que j'identifie, que c'est euh, cette période qui va de 1974 à 1981 avec les émeutes que vous voyez euh, à l'image et qui montre qu'à euh, cause de l'ampleur de la crise et de la rap rapidité de la crise, euh, on a eu euh, des, des premières formes de, de contestation qui sont organisées et qu'on voit à l'écran. Hein, euh, et en même temps, on a eu les premières formes de réindustrialisation dans les régions françaises les plus touchées par euh, la désindustrialisation. Je commencerai par cette phase-là et après je parlerai d'autres phases qui, sont, euh, qui suivent cette période 1974-1981. Alors, cette première phase, en fait, ce que vous voyez à, à l'écran, ce sont des événements insurrectionnels. On en trouve à Paris, mais aussi dans l'est de la France. Et en fait, c'est un phénomène de réaction, euh, un peu de, de désespoir, mais alors pas du désespoir au sens où euh, l'entendait peut-être Thomson sur des foules qui étaient affamées, etc. Ici, on est au XXe siècle et on n'a pas les mêmes, les mêmes conséquences, d'autant moins qu'en France, cette lutte, elle débouche sur une signature d'accord entre le, le patronat et les représentants syndicaux. C'est ce qu'en France, on appelle la CGPS, Convention générale de protection sociale, et c'est quelque chose qui permet des aménagements de la désindustrialisation. Donc, il y a, il y a un volet social dans la restructuration française. Ça, c'est la première phase. On, on absorbe la, la désindustrialisation hein, difficilement du côté des populations ouvrières, c'est image les images que vous voyez, et en même temps, on s'organise pour qu'on ait une période, finalement, où les ouvriers vont être encadrés. Il y a ensuite une deuxième phase qui va de 1980 à 1984, euh, et donc cette, cette phase c'est l'arrivée de la gauche au pouvoir alors on pourrait croire qu'effectivement comme du point de vue de l'économie morale on va dire même de la gauche on va avoir une réponse euh, positive aux, aux demandes des ouvriers dans le cadre de la désindustrialisation ça va être vrai hein. moi mon image je ne retranscrit pas ça mais ça va être vrai on va avoir euh, une mise en œuvre de politiques économiques et sociales qui sont très interventionnistes et qui vont répondre euh, aux difficultés du secteur mais ça ne suffira pas et ce sont les images que vous voyez à l'écran, hein, on, on voit qu'on reproche euh, à la gauche d'avoir quand même poursuivi euh, une politique qui avait été commencée avant son arrivée au pouvoir. J'ai retrouvé cette petite caricature où on voit aussi hein, euh, que les promesses de François Mitterrand ne sont, euh, sont pas forcément respectées. Et donc, c'est un moment qui a été aussi euh, mal vécu par les ouvriers, d'où euh, 
alors ça c'est une petite blague sur le, le dialogue au sein des, des entreprises nationalisées parce que finalement on se plaint qu'il n'y en ait pas euh, plus qu'avant hein, du dialogue et donc la deuxième phase 1981-1984 c'est une phase où euh, on va essayer euh, d'améliorer la sidérurgie, mais ça, ça ne marchera pas. Et donc, on va arriver à une autre phase. Euh, voilà, donc, il y a une protestation en 1984 des, des, des sidérurgistes. On va arriver à une troisième phase qui va de 1984 à 1995, pardon, où euh, la gauche de gouvernement et puis la droite qui lui succède, ont choisi de restructurer la sidérurgie et qui est considérée comme une industrie de moins en moins particulière, de moins en moins singulière. Et donc, il y a beaucoup de fermetures de sites, beaucoup de, de, de suppressions d'emplois. Et les révoltes que vous voyez, les manifestations sont peut-être moins dures qu'en 1979, sauf qu'on euh, a euh, un problème vis-à-vis -vis des promesses qui avaient été faites par le gouvernement, notamment de gauche, par rapport à ça. Donc, cette, cette phase-là, euh, va, va vite euh, se, se poursuivre et on s'aperçoit dans la dernière phase qui va de 1995 à nos jours et c'est un peu le sens de, de mon dessin que euh, tous les hommes politiques se seraient trompés sur euh, l'industrie et que c'est très difficile pour eux de gérer hein, l'économie morale qui va avec cette euh, sidérurgie et que finalement à l'époque euh, la plus proche de nous on retrouve, on retrouve les, mêmes, les mêmes problèmes avec toujours cette idée de promesse du candidat. Euh, là, on voit François Hollande qui va faire des promesses aux sidérurgistes, et finalement, euh, des, des sidérurgistes qui ne sont pas d'accord avec euh, la politique industrielle qui est menée. Et en fait, je pense que, et pour terminer, la révolte des sidérurgistes français, depuis 1979 jusqu'à ce que vous voyez à l'écran, 2012-2013, euh, ce sont des moments de protestation dont les déroulements et les dénouements sont intéressants pour euh, aborder le concept d'économie morale dans un monde industriel euh, où il n'y a ni émeute de la faim, ni insurrection générale, il faut imaginer autre, un autre monde que celui décrit par Thomson. En, en effet, les protestations des hommes et des femmes de, de, de la sidérurgie, c'est une sorte de protestation contre un contrat moral, contre des, des promesses qui avaient été faites aussi bien par des représentants politiques que par des représentants syndicaux. Et en fait, l'importance de la déception des sidérurgistes de leur famille vis-à-vis -vis du patronat, des pouvoirs publics, des représentants des partis censés les, les, les protéger, c'est lié aussi à une sorte de merveilleux économique et social qui avait été construit autour, euh, autour de l'industrie. Donc les exemples que j'ai retenus ici, et je termine par là, euh, c'est des exemples de, de protestation aussi contre une forme de disparition d'identité ouvrière, et ça rejoint hein, les, les communications qui ont été faites juste avant la mienne. Donc quelque chose qui est à la fois une protestation de déception et une protestation aussi contre la disparition de l'identité. Merci. Merci, Pascal.